we inform. Religious freedom is about people of faith being able to live out their faith, live out their convictions, no matter where they are. We equip. Sacred honor is the courage to speak truth, to live out your free speech. We also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. This is At The Core on American Family Radio. Welcome to The Core here on American Family Radio. Walker Wildman here with you on this edition of the program. Rick Green and myself, we're with you each week here on At The Core. And uh, we are just um, uh, under two weeks, about a week and a half away from Election Day. 11 days, I believe, to be more precise, and so much to talk about, so much to talk about. And uh, both campaigns, the Trump campaign and the Harris campaign, are virtually on uh, the road, on the campaign trail every day, and uh, so there's just a lot of content to cover and a lot of uh, issues to talk about, so that's what we're going to do on the program. This is a very consequential election Uh, I'm hesitant to say it's the most important in the history of our country. Some might could make a strong case for that. It's uh, undeniably the most important election in my lifetime, So, and in many of our lifetimes. So um, it is a very, very important election, and I don't want to um, uh, discount that under any circumstance. And um, early voting has begun in every state. So you can uh, vote early, and then, of course, on Election Day, you can go and vote in person. Election Day is November 5th, Tuesday, November 5th. And we're going to be having election coverage live on American Family Radio beginning at 6 p.m. Central. We're going to carry that coverage as long as we need to, but well into the evening of November 5th, possibly into the early hours of Wednesday. That's going to be... On November 5th, Tuesday, beginning at 6 p.m. Central here on AFR, on the AFR app. And we're going to be live streaming the video on stream.afa.net as well as all of AFR's Facebook pages. So be on the lookout for that on the evening of the election. We're going to track the results in real time. Speaking of the election, we just produced um a afa at home episode it's our sixth installment of our afa at home series where we have panel discussions of critical issues facing our country from a christian perspective we talk about marriage and family sanctity of life religious freedom biblical stewardship all of our core values we discuss in these uh, series well our latest edition is up it's free at stream.afa.net and I wanted to play a brief uh, preview of uh, the latest AFA at Home episode six. America is at a crossroads. We're talking about November 5th. The consequences of this election are broader than even sometimes I grasp. You only have two options, to vote or not vote. AFA at Home takes a deep look. Pray for fair elections, that God's hand is over these elections. It all impacts you directly. Make your voice heard. Don't miss this special edition of AFA at Home on AFA Stream. Visit stream.afa.net to sign up today. Stream.afa.net. There you have it, stream.afa.net. Check that out. We have it up for free for the next few days, and uh, so go there now and watch it. Uh, Episode 6 of our AFA at Home series. Well, Psalm 133, just before we jump into our, our clips and our headlines, Psalm 133 is where we are this week. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. That's a Psalm 133 verse one. Well, uh, I've got plenty of clips I want to cover. Um, the young, uh, young voters, that's a, a college age and young adults. These are um, a, a pretty substantial voting block now in America. And uh, traditionally, Democrats have uh, pretty much uh, run the board, if you will, uh, when it comes to young voters, especially college age voters. And um, this this cycle is a little bit different. Uh, President Trump is actually, I'm not going to say he's leading among young voters, but he's he's very competitive among young voters. And um, 
and and there are uh, uh, there's a generation that cares about what's going on in our country. I know uh, young people get a bad rap and 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 there's some uh, you know when you look at the indoctrination on our college campuses, there's uh, and the and the moral decline in America. There's definitely plenty of criticism to go around. Uh, but there is also a lot of young people that care deeply about our nation. They want, they themselves would like to have a future, a bright future in our country, and they don't like the direction of Marxism and socialism and mass importation of illegal immigrants. It's, it's very much a no-go for them when it comes to voting. And President Trump's economic policies, they want them back. Why? Because they want to be able to afford a first-time home. Uh, they want to be able to get married and start a family. They want to be able to have a good paying job. They want to be able to pay a dollar seventy five for gas. All of these things that were going on under President Trump's previous administration, a lot of these young people want those policies back. But specifically on the issue of illegal immigration, MSNBC was doing an interview with multiple voters in swing states uh, where they were asking them the issues that they care about. And this interview was actually uh, uh, around a barber shop and. Uh, MSNBC was was kind of going around the room and getting different young people's thoughts on what they think about the election. And listen to this young voter tell MSNBC that they're actually fully in favor of mass deportations when it comes to illegal immigration. Clip one. I agree with the idea of mass deportation, largely. You have criminals in this country who are destroying our nation. They're uh, coming in here, getting earmarked bills and policies to open up businesses, get free housing, get access, easier access than those who are legally immigrated to this country to welfare and other benefits. So, like, as a taxpayer, we have to pay for these guys to have luxuries of life, and we don't get anything, especially black Americans who have suffered so much in the system under Democrats. We don't get anything. Hmm. That's insane. You talked about Springfield, Ohio, and the whole thing with the fluff talk of, oh, grabbing a soundbite about, Haitians or whatever is eating cats and dogs. Y'all trying to change the narrative of what he's really talking about. Change the narrative of really what we're talking about and telling us that's what we should be discussing. No, this here, this is what we're discussing. This here, this is America. And this is what America is about and what we're discussing. So uh, clearly, a uh, young voter there in uh, Ohio, very upset about the mass importation of illegal immigrants under the Harris administration. And look, folks, these are not traditional conservatives. These are not traditional conservative voters. Most of these are inner city, either really non-political um, uh, uh, voters or citizens or are, are, are traditional Democrats. I mean, the, the Democrats have run the inner cities for decades. I've mentioned that. Look at the major cities that have been in decline for 50 to 70 years. Your Detroits of the world, your Chicago's, your San Francisco's. They've been in a bad place. Why? Because they've been run by Democrats. And many, uh, uh, to defend the Democrats, many of these inner city voters have been voting for the Democrats. Lock, I mean, I mean in lockstep. And but now that 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 is really falling apart. That 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 traditional deep blue inner city block that the Democrats have relied on for seventy years is beginning to crack. It's beginning to fall apart. Why? Because Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have been importing hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants into these inner cities. And what are these illegal immigrants doing? They are munching off of the public services that are there for the actual citizens. Fire department, police department, public transportation, public education. School gyms are being taken over to house illegal immigrants. Cities are saying, hey, we're out of money. Why are you out of money? Because we've been spending it to house illegal immigrants. So this is this this a mass immigration policy of Biden and Harris has directly resulted in inner city traditional blue voters turning against the Democrat Party. And that's the sentiment that you just heard there in that clip from a young gentleman out of the state of Ohio. Well, uh, continuing this uh, election discussion and really trying to help you understand where the candidates stand on the issue, uh, Bill Clinton is um, on the stump for Kamala Harris, which is rather surprising. And this 
pretty much tells you how uh, in bad of shape the Democrats are and Kamala Harris's campaign is. The fact that she has Bill Clinton uh, campaigning for her. I mean, this when you have to go to resort to having Bill Clinton on the campaign trail, um, things are not going very well, okay, out of all the surrogates she could choose. So Bill Clinton is on the stump for Kamala Harris, and he admitted um, on the campaign trail that Kamala Harris is in a very extremely vulnerable position when it comes to internal polling, clip five. But about 45% of the people think he can do no wrong and they don't care if we save our democracy or not. So there is a sliver there that has to make up their mind. And to them, Kamala Harris just showed up. I mean, she was there as <laughs> vice president. And what they think of her largely depends on what they think of President Biden. But she is extremely vulnerable, more vulnerable than she deserves to be <laughs> through crazy attacks. Wow. You talk about you talk about a bad surrogate, Bobby. He made no case for her. No, he's, it's as he's much actually, word salad as what she spills. He's actually hinting at how bad she is. Exactly. Because because he says he says, number one, voters, um, voters think of Harris. Uh, they th- what they think of Biden, they think of Harris, is what he said. Which means Biden's approval ratings ratings are like in thirty something percent in the thirty to forty percent range, which is historic lows. And remember, they replaced Biden because he wasn't polling well, but they replaced Biden with Biden's number two, Harris. Right. And what else does he jump on? He jump jumps on the denigrate Trump. Ch- chain a train about yes. look at what he's doing in terms of attacks which is nobody politics. cares it's politics yes there's mud slinging throughout give people meat in policies and there's yes. nothing there no there's nothing there and and to to president trump's attacks number one they're valid but bill clinton just admitted that they're working um, so, and, and, and <laughs> so, so let me ask this, does Kamala Harris's campaign not attack Trump? Because the last time I checked, she had a, held an emergency press conference on Wednesday outside of the residence of the vice presidency, uh, calling Trump, comparing him to Hitler. Mm. Um, so, uh, and who and, does that in a press conference? Well, yeah, right. A special press conference. Right, exactly. And she comes out of the vice president's residence, like 10 feet to this podium, makes a three-minute remark, doesn't take any questions, and walks back into the House. And then she accuses – and by the way, she's been off the campaign pain trail the last day and a half. And she says that President Trump looks tired and weary and worn out, and he's just not going to be able to hold up to the presidency. She's the one that's not on the campaign trail for half of the week. Why? Because she's preparing for interviews. Well, it's apparently not going very well because she just did a town hall with Anderson Cooper. And we're going to cover this in the next segment. But, folks – um, this is why President Trump's campaign wants Kamala Harris to talk more, because the more she talks, the worse it gets. I, I've actually never seen a candidate that is unable to answer questions. And I went back and uh, actually watched some clips from 2020, and Kamala Harris, to her defense, she did better answering questions in the Democratic primary in 2020 than she's doing now. I don't know what has changed. I don't know whether it's because she's trying to hide her real positions on the issues or she's actually disinterested in this whole presidency thing, or she just doesn't want to do the prep work. She's just there for the lights and the camera and the action. But but this is this is bad. I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen a candidate, and we'll play the clips in the next segment. I've never heard of a candidate that is unable to answer basic questions about her policy positions, whether it's tax policy, whether it's immigration policy, she regurgitates information, but there's no solid stances on the issues, and that's what voters are looking for. So point being stated here that the Democrats, they chose the wrong person. They got rid of Joe Biden, and they went with Kamala Harris, but boy, was it the wrong pick. Boy, was it the wrong pick. And uh, Joe Biden is no popular politician, but I tell you what, it's his, his numbers were looking better than this. And that's all I can tell you. We'll be back in a few minutes.
As a nurse, I primarily work with children who are abused and exploited in trafficking, and I frequently see very unfair situations. Uh, we must talk about the issue of abuse. We can't base our actions on fear. We have to be faith informed in what we do. The Dr. Nurse Mama Show. For more from Dr. Jessica Peck, tune in at 2 p.m. Central on American Family Radio or on the podcast page at AFR.net. You can't sit this election out. I know a lot of Christians do. This is true that God is sovereign. I tell you that all the time. Uh, but they fancy that somehow that is separate from their personal responsibility. We are his hands and feet. And so that's why we have to do what's right. The Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and just doesn't do it. To him, it is sin. Sandy Rios 24-7 with your host, Sandy Rios. Listen on the podcast page at AFR.net. If God could speak, what would he say? The Bible subjects itself to historical verification. He says, we saw this. We go to the Bible wanting to hear what the living God has to say to us. When God speaks, what does he say? The God Who Speaks. Visit thegodwhospeaks.org. The Stand provides a Christian perspective on current issues that are important to your family. Produced by the American Family Association, this monthly magazine is full of articles and stories about people who are making a difference in their community and around the world. Sign up today and receive a free six-month subscription. Visit thestand.net or call 1-800-326-4543. At The Core podcast are available at AFR.net. Now, back to At The Core on American Family Radio. Welcome back to The Core here on American Family Radio. Walker Wildman here with you on the program. Well, my grandfather, Don Wildman, went home to be with the Lord um, in December of this past year. And our American Family Studios team has really been spending the last two or three years producing a documentary on the life and the legacy of my grandfather, Don Wildman. The name of the uh, film is Culture Warrior, Don Wildman and the Battle for Decency in America. And it's an excellent documentary film. I've already watched it with the whole staff here. And we've had friends of the ministry come in and preview it as well. Well, this is being released to our Great Commission partners. Anyone who donates monthly to the AFA, to AFA, anyone who donates monthly to American Family Radio, they're going to get online exclusive access on AFA Stream beginning on October 28th. So not too long, far away, just a couple of days away. On October 28th, we're going to upload the Culture Warrior documentary to stream.afa.net for those who are Great Commission partners. And then on November 11th, about mid-November, we're going to release the full uh, documentary to uh, the public for free online. But before we uh, continue on with our election-related discussions and covering uh, the campaign trail and Trump and, and Harris's position on the issues, I want to play this clip. Listen to this Culture Warrior trailer. Here in the Christmas season of 1976, I sat down one night to watch television. As we started looking for something to watch, every channel had something inappropriate on it. There was nothing good. I became angry that night. I left the parish ministry and founded the National Federation for Decency. And I remember people going, you're going to do what now, exactly? Reverend Wildman. Reverend Wildman. The Reverend Donald Wildman. Reverend Wildman says the show is too sexually suggestive. We monitored television to see who was sponsoring the, the offensive shows. It was totally covered from the networks to the advertisers. Well, at first they wanted to ignore it, but then after a while they couldn't. NBC said the boycott is an obvious attempt at intimidation, and we will let the people judge the fairness of this tactic. I'd like to know what right you think you have to tell me what to watch on TV. <laughs> Send that question to the network, OK? He used to say, well, let everybody think I'm dumb. Said, that's to my advantage. <laughs> <laughs> you know who sells more pornography than anybody else in America? 7-Eleven, your friendly family convenience store. 
he stepped on a whole lot of toes early on, and they thought, I think, that they could just crush him. Don told me that, Ben, I've been sued by Penthouse and by Playboy. Things were changing, and many people just sort of acclimated to it, and Don Wildman didn't. The Last Temptation of Christ. It was going to be a blasphemous movie about the life of Jesus. We're not talking about the specifics. We're talking about the general theme. What you did with Brother Don as the leader, you, you got on and hung on as best you could. AVA is funded in part by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. So it was just vile stuff that was being funded by the government. If we lose this cultural war, we're going to have a hedonistic, humanistic society. He was, he was going to be faithful uh, and lead the success up to, to God. He's had an uncanny ability to look down the road and see the impact of things that are happening today. I'm, I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom. I'm trying to be honest with you. When you see people live out their faith, you know there's something to it. One person can make a difference. CultureWarrior.movie, that's the URL to check out that trailer, CultureWarrior.movie, and uh, be on the lookout for the full release coming up in the coming weeks. Well, back to our discussion of the election. Uh, Kamala Harris did a town hall with CNN and Anderson Cooper uh, within the last 24 to 48 hours, and uh, this is a pretty extensive town hall, and I would uh, – I would love to come here and bring all of the uh, meaty uh, discussion about Kamala Harris's position on the issues and what exactly she's going to do different than Joe Biden. But unfortunately, we didn't really get much of that. And uh, Anderson Cooper actually questioned Kamala Harris on uh, that uh, point specifically. You know, you, you've been in charge the last four years. What exactly have you been doing? <laughs> because you've got all these lofty goals, which are hard to nail down. Uh, and you say you're going to fix everything, but, you know, what have you been doing the last four years? This is, folks, this is very telling. Um, when Kamala Harris, a, a traditional candidate, when questioned about what are you going to do different uh, moving forward, can rattle off in 30 seconds five things that they're going to do different and better than previous administrations and previous presidents. But Kamala Harris, she, the, the CNN's trying to hand her this softball. I mean, all of these interviews, they basically tee it up for her, and she whiffs like no one I've ever seen before in the era or in the arena of politics. Let's listen to clip seven. Some voters, though, might ask, you've been in the White House for, for four years. You were vice president, not the president. But why wasn't any of that done over the last four years? Well, there was a lot that was done, but there's more to do, Anderson. And, and I'm pointing out things that need to be done that haven't been done but need to be done. <laughs> have to be done, need to be done, should be done. We got to get them done. We did something, but I'm not going to tell you what we did, but we've got to get stuff done. <laughs> this is the reason Anderson Cooper is asking her that is not to be hostile, but to tee it up for her. Because when you look at polling with voters, they don't know where she stands on the issues. So Anderson Cooper's trying to help her out. Hey, Kamala Harris, tell us what you're going to do in the next four years. Tell us what you're going to do different and tell us why you haven't been able to get anything done. And she just says, we've done a lot and we've got a lot to do and there's a lot to be done. And there's things we wish we could do that we're going to do. <laughs> Folks, uh, this is why the polling for Kamala Harris is looking terrible. Voters are looking for something and there's absolutely nothing there. And a further example of this, Anderson Cooper also questioned Kamala Harris on her tax policy because she herself has claimed that if you're making over if you're making under four hundred thousand dollars, that your taxes aren't going to go up at all under the Biden Harris tax plan. All right. That's according to Vice President Harris. If you elect her, they're going to raise taxes on the rich. That's what they say. The rich are going to pay their fair share, even though the definition of rich isn't, we don't know what who falls within that category. Um, but she says, oh, if you make under 400000 your taxes aren't going to go up at all. Well, Anderson Cooper wants to unpack that. Let's talk about your tax policy and what that's really going to look like. <laughs> well, let's see how that went. Clip six. So you're saying... 
Well, what what, what, you, what you're saying is anyone under four hundred thousand won't have taxes raised. Or are you saying that anyone above four hundred thousand will have a tax raise? I'm saying that there is going to be a parity around what the richest people pay in terms of their taxes. Right now, Anderson, you know, the document, it, it, it is well documented that some of the richest people in our country have gotten away with a zero tax rate. But if you're earning five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars under your plan, there's a good it, chance your taxes go up. It, it, this, we can't have this conversation without knowing what the, it's a very complicated <laughs> situation, right? <laughs> What was the last time you heard the word parity and tax policy in the same wow. sentence? Parity and tax policy were used in the same sentence. Mm. And and we wonder why voters are having a hard time grasping what on earth she's talking about. Whatever happened to fairness in the tax tables? <laughs> it's just it's just that That's simple. That's a good point. Fair. Yes. Whatever the rate is, flat rate. Yeah. And, and, no. and it's exponential mathematically so. Yeah. Our tax policy, to your point, Bobby, is overly convoluted. I mean, we got all these brackets and all these exemptions and all these deductions and all these, I mean, carve outs. And it's just patently absurd. She really wants to win over a lot of voters. Just a go fair, flat. fair tax, go flat. Yeah. yeah. No matter what your income is, whether you make 100000 400 or a million, here's your tax rate. And everybody's receptive to it because it's based on a consumer uh, consumption level type of thing. Exactly. But the reality is, Bobby, is that even Kamala Harris doesn't want to do a flat tax rate because she has to leave special provisions so that her billionaire donors yes, can have carve outs. Yes. Yeah, it's never uh, enough. Yeah, this is why our tax this is why we can't get true tax reform, Bobby, to your point, uh, that bring forth Rand Paul level common sense flat tax rate, simple tax rate is because um the Million and billionaires in our country, uh, the tax code is actually written in a way where they can do certain things with their with their monies and their assets and get deductions and end up pretty much flat in some instances where they really don't pay much taxes at all when you level it all out. That's why they claim – Kamala Harris claims, well, Donald Trump uh, paid zero dollars in taxes in this year. And I'm like, well, that, well Biden's been in politics for 50 years – and um, going on 60, actually, or more. And you guys have written the tax code, and y'all haven't fixed that. So the fact that Donald Trump has figured out a way to, to game the tax system legally and not pay any taxes is actually kudos to him and shame on y'all. I mean, you guys have been in charge for 12 of the last 16 years with Obama and Biden, and if y'all want to fix the tax code and tax the rich, let's go for it. Let's do it now. But you guys don't want to do anything because those are the folks that are funding the campaign. So it's all talk, no action. But what's new in Washington, D.C.? Not much at all. Um, did you know that uh, Nathan Wade, the assistant to uh, Fonnie Willis, the prosecutor in Fulton County that's trying to lock President Trump up um, for the events that unfolded, in uh, 2020 and 2021 when it comes to the election integrity in Fulton County and the surrounding areas, um, the uh, prosecutor, the uh, county prosecutor, actually the ex-Fulton County prosecutor, Nathan Wade, he admitted under sworn testimony with the House Judiciary Committee that he visited the Biden uh, White House on multiple occasions leading up to the charges being brought against Donald Trump. Can you imagine that? So Nathan Wade, who's a chief prosecutor with uh, the Fulton County District Attorney's Office that has been trying to lock President Trump up for the last two years, went after or went to uh, the Biden White House and coordinated with Biden staffers. And it's still uh, unclear whether or not he met with Joe Biden himself. He actually wouldn't answer that question directly in the sworn testimony. Uh, and we don't know if, if Biden slipped into the meeting or not. But what it does tell us is that the Fulton County Prosecutor's Office, which is not which is supposed to be apolitical, which is supposed to apply the law fairly and equally across the board, colluded with President Trump's Democrat opponent, Joe Biden, uh, in order to charge and attempt to lock up President Trump. Now, when was the last time that Republicans did that? Well, you're not going to find any examples because it just hasn't happened. But can you imagine the outrage if President Trump brought forth, let's say, a a Dallas County prosecutor from Texas and 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 conjured up charges against 
Kamala Harris while he was in the presidency or Joe Biden or Obama or Clinton or whoever on earth he's running against. Can you imagine if President Trump brought a a red state, a red county prosecutor into the Oval Office, into the White House on multiple occasions and coordinated and strategized about how he's going to lock up his political opponents? See, this is the projection that I'm talking about. When Kamala Harris accuses President Trump of being Hitler, which she did this week at an emergency press conference outside of her residency, she actually is the one that is carrying out the political prosecution and the political persecution of her political opponents. The Biden White House colluded with the Fulton County District Attorney Office, and there's evidence that the Biden White House colluded with Letitia James and the New York Attorney General's office to lock up President Trump. It's Biden's uh, DOJ that launched the special counsel's office, Jack Smith, to go after President Trump on the phony documents case. All right. Meanwhile, they found documents, classified, by the way, and top secret documents at the Biden residency in Delaware. Well, where were they in the Biden Biden, uh, residency in Delaware? Well, they were in the garage with the Mustang. All right. Corvette, so, Corvette, yeah. Corvette, sorry. Right. And that got that got <laughs> completely dismissed. Right. Within in short order. Oh, the uh, the DOJ looked into it and there's nothing there and they closed it out. I mean, it was a matter of months. They closed the whole thing out. But me- meanwhile, we still got this documents case against Trump open in Florida. Now, thankfully, the uh, uh, local federal judge there closed the whole thing out. But but Jack Smith's still trying to get it. He's still trying to go after it. Uh, the Supreme Court struck him down on the immunity cl- case, on the immunity clause. Well, what did he do? He refiled it um, in in the D.C. District Court to try to lock up President Trump. So um, this, uh, the Democrats, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, are the actual ones that are going after, persecuting, prosecuting, trying to lock up their chief political opponent. And that's what they claim President Trump wants to do. And, and if we if we can be honest here, let's be honest, President Trump actually should lock up people who break the law. And it really doesn't matter whether they are, whether they were his political opponent. Political party, political affiliation really shouldn't matter in our justice system. That's why you look at Lady Justice, what does she have over her eyes? She has a blindfold because justice should be blind. So if we're being honest and we apply the law equally across the board to everyone, then you are going to have a lot of Democrats that go to jail. That's a car, That's a cold, hard fact. Because the Democrats are traditionally the party of lawlessness. Whether you're talking about the Hillary Clinton classified email scandal where she was hosting classified documents on her private server in the bathroom of a private residence, whether you're talking about Obama and the um, Fast and Furious scandal where the cartels got a hold of American arms and killed a Border Patrol agent under Eric Holder, by the way. Whether you're talking about Lewis Lerner and the intentional slow walking of conservative and liberty-minded groups with the IRS certification. And we could go case after case, whether you're talking about Act Blue, which is the Democrat funding operation, fundraising operation, and how they're funneling a lot of dark money and anonymous donors through Act Blue. I mean, there is scandal after scandal. So if we're being honest and we apply the law equally, Democrats will be locked up. I started playing basketball at nine years old. I ended up having teammates that were my teammates all the way up through high school. And the Lord began to challenge me. Abe, you're a Christian, but have you ever shared the gospel with your teammates? I began to realize, no, I had. What I'm saying is that God moved me to be concerned beyond me. It is impossible for you to be truly born again, yet you remain unconcerned about the people around you. Tune in to the Hamilton Corner, weekdays at 5 p.m. Central on American Family Radio. Pray scripture-based prayers, and God will use you to be a greater blessing because you asked him to. Heavenly Father, you are holy. Bring your kingdom here. 
Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have wronged us. Deliver us from the evil one in Jesus' name. Amen. Read the article Kingdom Prayers by Joseph Parker on thestand.net. Thestand.net. How do you deal with it when the person that you're caring for doesn't show gratitude? We're not in bondage to other people's gratitude. He came with no thought of our gratitude. He loved us while we were enemies. Who were we to withhold that which was given so lavishly to us? Join Peter Rosenberger on Hope for the Caregiver, Saturdays at 7 a.m. and Sundays at 10 p.m. Central on American Family Radio. My wife, Jan, played in the marching band in high school and then in college. They all had matching uniforms, but when they played the music, nobody played exactly the same thing. As believers, unity of the faith, we're not the same. Uh, we're different. We have different parts to play, mm. but there can be unity as we play our part in Christ Jesus. Exploring the Word, weekday afternoons at 3 Central on American Family Radio. At The Core podcast are available at AFR.net. Now, back to At The Core on American Family Radio. Welcome back to The Core. Walker Wildman here with you on this edition of the program. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Just type in At The Core, whether you're on an Apple device, Android, Roku, uh, Spotify, whichever platform you use. Just type in At The Core and you can subscribe uh, to the program there. Chris is with us. Chris, welcome back. Thank you. All right. Chris is with American Family News. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris, the um, you have a few economic stories, and I would love to talk about and play more clips of Kamala Harris um, not really articulating at all her positions on the issues. But uh, these ec- economic headlines, I believe, integrate well into the story of the election mm-hmm. because consum- consumers are still really underwater uh, when it comes to wages and affordability, and the headlines are bearing that out. Yes. Uh, this one is from Fox Business. Uh, mortgage rates rise for fourth straight week. This is from October 24th. Mortgage rates continued their upward trajectory this week, climbing for a month straight while further pushing down demand in the stalled housing market. More on that for just a minute. Uh, Freddie Mac's latest primary mortgage market survey released Thursday showed that the average rate on the benchmark 30-year fixed mortgage surged to 6.54% from last week's reading of 6.44%. You might remember, America, when we talked about this last week, we talked about mortgage rates rising to 6.4%. So what does this mean in English? It's gotten worse. Yeah. Yeah, th- Chris, this is, a, this is a major headline. Because uh, housing affordability has been an issue for several years, Mm -hmm. and especially since COVID, it's been unusually unaffordable. Um, J.D. Vance actually talked about this when he was talking about we've got 25 million people here illegally, and they're using up some of our housing, and that's why there's a shortage Mm -hmm. in part. Mm -hmm. Um, But the, the lack of movement in the housing market uh, it is it could spell? I'm not gonna say 08 type like housing uh, market crash level stuff, right? But but this is this is not good. The fact that houses are not moving at a moderate uh, interest rate. I mean, we're at a moderate mortgage rate mortgage rate level. We're not at 15 20 percent like mm-hmm. we were back in the the 70s and 80s. Thankfully, yes. Um, <laughs> so we're around six or seven percent, which is uh. Uh, historically high in the mm-hmm. last 20 or 30 years, but still not crazy. But but uh, mortgage applications have slowed down mm-hmm. because not only do you have slightly elevated mortgage rates, but the home value, the asset price for the houses are right. still very much elevated. Yeah. And to go with this, existing home sales fell to their lowest level this week since 2010. There's another housing issue there. We've mm-hmm. talked about this before. We'll probably talk about it again if the Lord tarries. When houses are not selling, other houses are not being built, things are not being made for those houses to be bought and put into the house. There's all kinds of problems here beyond just housing. And yeah, the mortgage rate is not as bad as it once was, but the money that we would have to spend on the mortgage is going out the window to pay for energy and other things that we're having to do to live. Yeah, I mean, only people that have margin are the ones that are buying and selling now. 
uh, because they can go from three to seven percent interest rate on their mortgage. And, and yeah, they don't like it, but they can figure it out. But the rest of the country, which is why you have this number here, they're just stuck. They're, they're stuck in limbo mm -hmm. until these mortgage rates go down or the housing market begins to level out. But we really haven't, and, and I'm not saying we're going to go back to pre-COVID numbers when it comes to home values, but they're astronomical now, and yeah. they have not come down. And it's, 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 it's rather uh, unsettling for people trying to buy homes. It really is. I, I know someone uh, not far from where I live, their house was on the market for well over a year um, and it was a beautiful house. If I had the money, I would have bought it as a uh, as a second home and and done something with it. But I couldn't afford it because the housing prices, you know, pushed the asking price up to a point I couldn't afford it. Right. And the the other issue is, yeah, let's say you sell your house and you and all of a sudden you have three hundred some odd thousand dollars in your bank account overnight. Uh, you then have to go find a place to live. So there goes that money. Yes. And, you know, Vice President Kamala Harris is out there saying she has a plan that would build more housing. Uh, and that's going to bring down the it's going to ease the supply and demand issues. But she's also wanting to, at the same time, give people twenty five grand to put towards a home. Right. Which is inflationary. Yeah, anytime yeah. government gets involved to make something better, more often than not, it makes it worse, yeah. which is why people are concerned about. This. Well, the way you stimulate the housing sector is you get mortgage rates down to three or four percent. You get inflation down, you get energy costs down, um, and uh, and you get wages up. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how you mm -hmm. do it. You don't need more government stimulation. That's going to create inflation. Um, when it comes to uh, businesses, uh, Chris, we're at a probably 10 to 15-year high when it comes to bankruptcy filings. Um, uh, this year's well over... Um, I think the latest number I saw was between 800 and 900 bankruptcy filings just this year with major companies. And, and the food industry is really struggling. Yes. Uh, we've seen this. Um, well, McDonald's is doing well since President Trump visited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the latest numbers I looked at. Right. Great marketing ploy, uh, by the way, for McDonald's. Um, when I was watching President Trump, uh, you know, fry French fries, in the deep fryer, it made me want to go get a Big Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've heard that from others as well. Uh, but uh, Red Lobster uh, has filed bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they're struggling pretty heavily. Food's already very competitive, very low margins. But we have another, another American staple that's struggling. Yeah. Is that right? Denny's, of all places, is to close 150 restaurant locations. Uh, and it's according to the company, these places are going to close this year. Uh, this is due to a number of things, including higher uh, food prices. Obviously, uh, depending on the state or the city in which the Denny's is operating in, they have to pay sometimes well above the federal minimum wage. And all these things are kind of the the thing that just sucks the company down under, and they they end up closing. Yeah. And, and the really bad thing is, you know, going back to the real estate situation, so you have neighborhoods there that are, in, that are in, having problems, and then you go out into the uh, entertainment districts, and you have empty shells that are sitting there that nobody can afford to open up another business in. No, a, a mom and pop is going to have a very difficult time buying that Denny's property and trying to start their own breakfast place because the Denny's was able to swing it because it's part of a company and they were getting things at a discount or whatever else, whereas yeah. mom and pop's not going to be able to do that. And there's not anybody necessarily... Uh, chomping at the bit to, uh, you know, com replace Denny's with the next right. thing, the, you know, the same issue. Yeah, and this is what this is what voters are seeing before their very eyes. They're seeing American staples uh, like Denny's, for example. Um, and, and I'm not going to say Red Lobster is an American staple, but it's been around a good while. Well-known company. And it's a very well-known American corporation. Um, but, but when you see major um, staple brands... Um, that are closing up shop because of the e economy and the challenging economic environment, um, that, that's, that's a really downer on voters mm -hmm. and consumers. Um, so not, not a very good look for the Biden-Harris economy. Well, and uh, Walgreens is having issues, too. You know, yeah. Obviously, that's a pharmaceutical giant out I think there. they're closing 1,200 stores. Yeah, and uh, you know they sell a lot of stuff beyond just medications. Uh, they sell all, all kinds of health and beauty items. They sell food. 
And when those places are closing, that means fewer and fewer options for people, especially in big cities like Chicago, yeah. where Walgreens is kind of, you know, got, kind of got its start. In bigger cities, if you've never been to a big city, um, America, uh, <laughs> generally, you know, Walgreens might be where you would go to get a few items because there's not necessarily a Walmart or some other big box retailer there. Yeah. So if they're closing these places, that's fewer and fewer places you have to find something. And there have been a number of cities for a long time now that have been labeled kind of food deserts in certain areas where that you can't even get groceries in certain parts of town. This is not good, and uh, something needs to happen. Yeah, I think this is trickling down to voters, and that's why they're frustrated uh, because they're seeing, they're seeing the, the poor economic consequences of the Biden-Harris administration right in front of their very eyes. Well, uh, speaking of that, Chris, I've got a clip here. This is uh, Kamala Harris recently doing a sit-down interview, another one with CNN, by the way, uh, where she's talking about um, abortion and whether or not there should be any religious exemption for doctors and hospitals and religious-based uh, charities that don't want to either fund or participate in abortion. Let's listen to this. Some of those voters that I spoke with at some of the events yesterday, for example, talked about they were there to support you, but also your agenda when it comes to reproductive rights mm -hmm. and abortion access. And you have cast yeah. this as a matter of literal life and death, as an urgent priority here. Mm. If you win, it is entirely possible that Congress will be controlled by Republicans. So what specific concessions would you be willing to make in order to get something done on abortion access as soon as possible? Religious exemptions, for example, is that something that you would consider? I don't Republican think we should be Congress? making concessions when we're talking about a fundamental freedom to make decisions about your own body. A basic freedom has been taken from the women of America, the freedom to make decisions about their own body. And that cannot be negotiable. <laughs> well, that was actually with NBC. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was her opportunity to come off as moderate right. and appeal to Catholics and Christians and Jews and others who don't want to participate in the horror of abortion. And instead, Chris, her answer is, we ought not have any exceptions. Yeah, the freedom candidate, and I'm using the air quotes here, <laughs> doesn't want people to live out their faith on on the in the job. Yes, uh, they. She's basically saying you can't do that. Uh, and we all know Planned Parenthood, is a, Planned Parenthood is a huge supporter of her, donate money to her and, and things like that. So she's trying to court those people. But I mean, there's a lot of people out there that do live out their faith in the workplace and. This is a concern because if she's going to do it to doctors and medical professionals, right. she'll have no problem doing it to you. We already know that her and Joe tried to force everybody to that has a job to get a shot or they yes. don't get their job. That's a valid point. We've seen this in action, right? We've seen military members dismissed, discharged mm -hmm. because they wouldn't get the experimental COVID shot. Um, we saw religious exemptions specifically denied and blocked. Uh, within the military. Mm -hmm. So, so Chris, this is this is how they view us. Yes. I'm talking about us Christians. Mm -hmm. This is how they view us. We're, th there are no carve-outs where we can still hold firmly to our religious beliefs and be participate in public life. They say there should be no ex yeah. exceptions. This is why people find it laughable that she takes uh, several minutes to try to uh, tout her faith uh, to Anderson Cooper on the CNN town hall. We all know that's a joke. Yeah. Uh, she doesn't she doesn't want any she doesn't want to listen to anybody uh, that's a person of faith. Um, she does want them to vote for her. But deep down, she really doesn't care a lick about them. And, you know, this is all the more reason why you should never, ever, ever have government oversee something like health care, because when government gets its hands in an industry and they start pumping in all kinds of money. Yeah, uh, that's why, you know, that's why they're saying, hey, nurses, you have to get the covid shot or we're not going to give your hospital, your employer, Medicare. Yeah, funds. That, that's a travesty and an injustice, Chris, that was never ad uh, adjudicated. Um, we, we need to really go back and relitigate and 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 relook at that entire COVID mania yes. and how people were mistreated. We never got to the bottom of that. Um, but I, Chris, I don't want to hear anything from the Democrats about um, about Christian, about churches and mm -hmm. religious organizations like ours favoring or disfavoring candidates, uh, because in Atlanta, in in Georgia, Kamala Harris last week went to a church. Mm -hmm. Um, where she not only was prayed over, which is rather demonic, um, but she also, uh, considering her position on abortion and all mm -hmm. the things that are ungodly, but also she uh, spoke from the podium, spoke from the pulpit in the church uh, in, in, in Georgia. So 
This whole uh, double standard where you and I have to walk over eggshells when we're on radio because we're a nonprofit, we're an association of churches, and we can't favor or disfavor candidates. Right. But Kamala Harris gets to go to a minority church mm-hmm. in Georgia and basically have a campaign rally. Right. The enforcement of the Johnson Amendment has been an absolute joke. Yeah. Uh, I've been here 14 years. It's been around a lot longer than I've been here. It's been around since before we were alive, the Johnson yeah. Amendment. And it is very loosely policed. Government knows uh, government sees a violation like government knows there's a violation there when I forget the metaphor I'm trying to use here. Yeah. It, it picks and chooses when there's a violation. Yeah, like the the I know it when I see it, yeah. which is which is the standard that the left uses sometimes. Somebody on X, I forget who it was. It might have been just some Joe Sixpack or maybe somebody we all know and, and follow or whatnot. But they they made a good point I thought uh, about her event at the church. Uh, they said if Donald Trump had done this uh, at say First Baptist Dallas with Dr. Robert Jeffress, the left would have lost its mind. Absolutely, but she, it, she gets a pass. Yeah, yeah. They, the headline would have be would have been. Um, uh, Trump campaigns with bigot Jeffress. Mm, yes, <laughs> that right. would have been the CNN headline. Yeah, Trump, Trump. Even though I love Pastor Jeffress, Trump takes takes over House of God. Yes, and claims America is whatever. I mean, yeah. You know, Brian Stelter would have had a show again, and he would have gone nonstop wall to wall coverage talking yeah. about it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think, look, President Trump doesn't need to shy away from uh, the support that he has amongst evangelicals and Christians. He doesn't need to shy away from that. And his administration really needs to embrace that. Why? Because 85 to 86 percent of voters, evangelical Christian voters, vote for him. They put him over the finish line in 2016. Um, and the vast majority of them uh, worked in the administration with him and one of her one, one, were one of his chief allies mm-hmm. uh, during his first term. So this this distancing from evangelicals is really undue. Yes, and it's all the more reason why me, more people need to be concerned about her saying no religious exemptions for abortions. Yes, because that paves. If nobody cries foul, if nobody goes to court over that, and you don't get a ruling against her, yes. you're allowing this potential president or some other one to say, you know what, you can't say anything about homosexuality or you can't have a Bible. Yes. All these other things. Yeah, and, and American Family Association actually sued the Biden administration in the early days of the administration uh, on the shot mandate, mm-hmm. the vaccine mandate in the Fifth Circuit. And we actually won on religious freedom grounds because we weren't going to force our employees to violate their beliefs and get an experimental shot uh, that can do them harm. So we actually beat the Biden administration on that. But that's just one example of the disdain that Kamala Harris has for Christians and evangelicals. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. All right, folks, vote, vote, vote. Go to American Family News, AFN.net, for all of your headlines from a Christian perspective. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio.